Hello and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown. Today is Wednesday, December 21st, and we are back with our last episode of 2022. And as we did in the last couple of years, we're going to do a wrap up, a, a rundown, if you will, of all of the year's stories. And there's a lot of things that we covered, so we wanted to kind of group them together for you to make it a little bit easier to digest. Uh, joining me, of course, is the man, the myth, and all of the legends, Mr. Stephen Foskett. Stephen, thanks for a great 2022. There was a lot to talk about. There is a lot to talk about, Tom, so I'm not going to banter. Uh, let's just dive right in. And I'm going to start uh, with China, and specifically uh, with the uh, increasing tensions between the Western world and China. So as we mentioned last week, there's been a ton of news about tech and China in 2022, uh, both dealing with the tech industry in the country as, uh, as they uh, look to reduce their dependence on China, as well as uh, increasing uh, nationalization and growth of assets within China and distribution of production outside. And we're going to get to some of those in, in a little bit later. But um, first, let's look back at the, uh, the state of the news. So back in January, uh, we talked about the fact that Intel announced a brand new mega fab here in Ohio. Um, you, you might not know it, but Tech Field Day's headquarters are in Ohio. Um, and so Intel is going to be building a massive, uh, massive new fab with their leading process nodes uh, down near Columbus, Ohio. Um, this was a big, big story, and it remains a big story. In fact, uh, they broke ground on it. Um, they uh, have actually made uh, some serious progress on that fab. So we'll talk about uh, Intel in a little bit more detail later. But I think it's important to understand that um, all of these stories are related to the situation in China. Uh, we talked as well in uh, March, the fact that Intel is going to invest $19 billion in manufacturing chips in Germany. And that a lot of this money is coming from the CHIPS Act. So in July, we covered that in a little bit more detail as well, that there's a $52 billion uh, act that would uh, provide funding for companies like Intel, yes, but also uh, fundings like uh, TSMC and Micron and SK Hynix and others that are uh, Samsung that are trying to build uh, fabs here in the United States. And similar funding has appeared uh, nationwide in other in other places uh, as well to try to to spurn, uh, spur investment in, in, in there. Uh, we talked in uh, July as well about the fact that uh, SK Hynix is another uh, company that's uh, trying to access those chip uh, chips act funding in order to build a packaging factory in the United States, which is actually uh, a, a very important aspect of overall chip design. And then finally, um, you know, later in the year, we talked about sort of the impact of this. Um, the United States in September announced that it was going to be turning up the heat and um, on China and restricting the sales of advanced uh, processors, including the latest NVIDIA GPUs and AMD GPUs. Uh, this was a serious concern as well, uh, because uh, frankly, after that, uh, you know, later in September and actually into uh, here this month, uh, November, December, uh, we've been seeing that there's actually been some uh, acceleration of these restrictions to the point that just uh, we talked about last week, uh, the uh, companies in uh, Japan and in the Netherlands uh, that are critical to making advanced semiconductors are also going to be getting on board and restricting their access, uh, China's access to their products as well. So this is, um, this is a huge deal. Uh, it's, ca it's caused a lot of concern. Um, like I said as well, it's spur spurring the, the, the growth of new fabs in, in different places. Uh, Micron is going to be building a huge fab in uh, New York, it looks like. Uh, we talked about that in September. Um, and, and so overall, the situation with China, as we're going to talk about all throughout this episode, is causing all sorts of ripples in the technology industry. And, and of course, I didn't even mention COVID and the supply chain shock at all, which of course are also big stories that we've been hearing about all year long. Yeah, Stephen, another big story that we hear a lot about is 5G, uh, because it's a very transformational technology and end users are really starting to adopt it. But that doesn't mean that it's a slam dunk without its challenges. 
Uh, we did see a couple of big stories this year around 5G that could impact the way that it's being adopted. And I think the biggest one that we kind of saw going back and forth uh, was the use of 5G's C-band around airports. I mean, we had reports from the U.S. FAA that it could potentially cause problems with older altimeters. Uh, they brought this up at the 11th hour to try to block the implementation of these frequencies. AT&T and Verizon decided to graciously back off and say, okay, well, we'll do a little bit of investigation, but you also have to do some on your side. And that happened, you know, a little bit earlier this year, back in January. Well, by the time we got all the way down to October, uh, the FAA was like, oh, cool, that worked. Let's make it permanent because we don't ever want to have to do any extra work. And so, you know, the, the carriers were like, but we were counting on having all of this available frequency for our use. And now you're telling us we can't use it. And the FCC has just kind of basically shrugged their shoulders and said, hey, um, you know, we, we, we don't know what to do here. And that comes on the heels of the fact that if you look back in um, April, uh, Broadcom released some of the very first Wi-Fi 7 chipsets. You're probably wondering, well, what does Wi-Fi 7 have to do with 5G? Well, if you've heard any of the conversation that's been going on between Wi-Fi 6 and 6E and 5G, you know that people kind of have them set up like the Hatfields and the McCoys, the Coke and Pepsi of the wireless uh, communications industry. And they think you have to pick between one or the other. Well, now that we have Wi-Fi 7 coming out, hot on the heels of the ratification of Wi-Fi 6E, people are starting to ask, well, you know, should I hold off? Should I wait for 6G? There's so many things that are up in the air right now. We can't even get the regulatory bodies to agree on how it should be handled. And unfortunately, I think that's going to drive people to wait when they shouldn't. And we're going to be forced to keep older technologies around. There was even a story earlier this year about AT&T shutting off their 3G network finally. And, um, you know, who knows how long LTE is going to have to be around if we can't get Wi-Fi 6E and 7 and 5G to play nicely with each other. Well, thanks, Tom. Let's look at one of the big winners from 2022, and that is AMD. I think it's hard to say that anyone had a better year than, uh, than AMD in the tech industry. They spent the year positioning themselves to challenge everyone for the crown of top chip maker, and they finished out the year by introducing their fourth generation Epic server CPU platform and uh, really kind of sealing that deal. But let's uh, zoom back earlier in the year. Now, as we're going to talk about here in a moment, uh, in the DPU space, we saw AMD finalize their acquisition of Xilinx, which we talked about last year, and we also saw them acquire Pensando. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. On the, uh, the mainstream chip side, we saw launches of uh, laptop chips. We saw a new generation of graphics. Uh, one of the big stories back in May was that AMD is going to be using uh, TSMC's three nanometer chips for their Zen 5 CPUs. Uh, this means that uh, basically AMD and Apple are probably going to have the leading process nodes out there for a little while in uh, 2023. And that's big news for the company. But of course, uh, bigger news came uh, with their uh, roadmap release in June when we heard about Zen 4 and Zen 5 and Ryzen and all these other things and, and kind of seeing how this whole puzzle puts, uh, is, is put together over there at AMD. Uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, we were definitely extremely impressed uh, with the, uh, the, the map that's been lined up by, uh, by AMD with, with all of these products. And of course, that came to a head, as I mentioned, in November with the announcement of the Genoa line at Supercomputing. Uh, these are the next generation chips. Uh, one of the big things that we see in them is another topic we're going to talk about here on the rundown, CXL. So AMD ended up being uh, first to market with a mainstream uh, CPU platform that supports CXL. Uh, they have launched ahead of Intel. Uh, they've launched with uh, PCIe 5, with DDR5, with lots of cores. I mean, honestly, it's, it's a tremendous announcement and AMD deserves a big pat on the back for everything they've managed to achieve here in uh, 2022. And we really look forward to seeing where they go next in 2023. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Stephen, DPUs are some of the hottest technology in 2022, not just because they're a new hardware spec, but they're actually changing the way that people are writing workloads to work with them. And there were a lot of companies that kind of tried to get on the bandwagon with this uh, innovation. Uh, like you mentioned, the first one that we saw was from AMD early in the year when they picked up uh, Xilinx when they closed on that acquisition. But more importantly, uh, later on in the year in April when they bought uh, Pensando, 
which was a DPU manufacturer from some of the brain trusts that had powered a lot of Cisco uh, technology over the years, uh, leveraging things like P4, making it a little bit more of an open platform. Uh, then we saw uh, funding coming in for companies like PlyOps getting $100 million to build their DPU platform. And then we heard about Fungible getting picked up by Microsoft uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the big news being that that platform will probably be going directly into Microsoft Azure and not be available necessarily directly to customers. And when you add that into the fact that Amazon at reInvent really started to talk a lot about the Nitro DPUs and even have introduced some new networking technologies to help accelerate their uh, communications in the cloud, but that rely on the Nitro, we're starting to see a lot of companies that are kind of saying, listen, we have an offering that can make things go really, really, really fast, but only if your developers are willing to ride around it. So in 2023, it could very well be that we're seeing NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD kind of uh, setting themselves up to be the, um, the dealers of these DPUs to the clouds and the hybrid slash private cloud market of customers. And if you want your applications to run as fast as possible, you're going to have to figure out a way to include DPUs in that offering. You know, a lot of those DPUs as well, Tom, are using ARM CPUs. And speaking of ARM, there was a lot of news about non-x86 technology in 2022. Could 2023 finally be the year of ARM in the data center, ARM in the cloud? Uh, or maybe Risk Five is going to sneak in and have a little bit of an impact. Let's talk about the news for these alternative platforms in 2022. So things kicked off with a bang uh, at the end of last year and the beginning of this year when NVIDIA uh, finally uh, was blocked and, and ended up backing away from their acquisition of ARM. Now, this was uh, going to be a real blockbuster and would have led NVIDIA to becoming basically an alternative supplier like Intel and AMD in the in it, basically every, every part of, of computing. Uh, didn't happen, not going to happen. And uh, we're still kind of up in the air about exactly what's going to happen to ARM in the future. But one thing we know for sure is that ARM is going to be doing a lot more, and uh, there's going to be a lot more ARM CPUs out there. So in June, uh, Ampere brought out their next generation um, uh, Ampere platforms with, uh, for servers that use ARM cores. Uh, we saw HPE announce that it's going to be using Ampere's uh, Ultra ARM CPUs as well in the ProLiant. So there's a ProLiant with, uh, with ARM cores in it now. And of course, uh, we saw a lot of noise about ARM cores uh, with Amazon at reInvent as well this year. Another thing we heard this year was a lot of news about lawsuits involving ARM. So as I mentioned, uh, NVIDIA was forced to back off from their acquisition. Uh, Qualcomm bought a company called Nuvia uh, last year, and um, they were planning on bringing these chips to market. We were speculating whether it would be in the mobile or the desktop or the cloud or embedded or where, but it sounds like they really did want to use them for servers, and ARM was having none of it. So um, back in uh, August and September, we heard a lot about uh, uh, ARM deciding to sue Qualcomm over Nuvia, and uh, that's still not resolved. It's probably not going to be resolved for a while. But I think it's safe to say that ARM is kind of doubling down on this space and trying to make sure that they're a major player in the server market as well. And of course, we heard about that as well in uh, late September when ARM announced their next generation Neoverse cores. Uh, we also uh, saw a sneak peek of uh, ARM supporting CXL in these cores, which is pretty exciting. But of course, ARM is not the only alternative chipset uh, or uh, instruction set that we're hearing about. Uh, RISC-V pioneer Sci-5 raised a bunch of cash back in March to combat ARM. Uh, they've got their own chips. They've been aggressively out there marketing these and licensing these and getting huge wins. A lot of these wins have been under the cover in embedded systems and hard drives and networking devices and so on. But uh, this all kind of came uh, out in the open later in the year. In fact, just last week, we talked about uh, Ventana, a company that's going to be using RISC-V for data center CPUs. So think about it this way. In 2023, we're going to have many core, very functional uh, data center CPUs with ARM and RISC-V, as well as, of course, Intel and AMD. And all of these platforms support the big technologies like PCIe 5, DDR5, and of course, CXL. So it's going to be really exciting to see where this goes in 2023 in the data center and in the cloud. 
Well, it wouldn't be a rundown without talking about some hacking and security news. I mean, it felt like every week we could have done a ransomware story, but instead of doing yet another ransomware story, I wanted to take a real quick look at something I think was a bigger overall story, and that was actually the rise of a new hacking gang called Lapsus. If you think back to the end of March, uh, there were two really big stories back to back. NVIDIA managed to get themselves hacked, and then Samsung did too. What was embarrassing in both of those hacks is that company source code was leaked publicly on the internet. And as the uh, authorities did a little bit more investigation, they found out that uh, part of the group was based in Brazil and the other part was based uh, with a group of teenagers in the UK. And they had a very novel way of attacking uh, customers. Instead of doing anything crafty with uh, technology, they used good old fashioned social engineering. They were able to uh, sneak in, pay some disgruntled employees to get access to the systems, or as we found out later in the year, especially with the Uber hack in September, uh, they actually goaded one of the employees into responding to repeated two-factor authentication requests that allowed them to compromise everything inside of Uber to the point where they were inside of Uber's uh, employee Slack channel as admins and were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And that's not to say the fact that Cisco got hacked by them as well. So with the the other geopolitical events causing some of the Eastern European hacking crews to kind of, um, you know, refocus their efforts, if you will, the rise of these new crews was especially interesting. And then we also got some news kind of in the middle of the year in May that the Department of Justice has finally decided that if you're trying to hack into a company for the purposes of security research, that they're not going to press charges, which was a huge sigh of relief for the security research uh, groups out there, because now it means that you can't, uh, have a situation where a contract goes bad and then all of a sudden the company is suing you for hacking them. And that will actually help identify some of these crews, either they're the uh, the lapsus gang or possibly the reconstituted groups like R Evil, which kind of disappeared into thin air earlier this year. But, you know, we're expecting them to come back. So as malware and ransomware become a more ever-present piece of what we think about from the cybersecurity perspective, it's important to remember that a lot of these narratives are being driven by some of these groups. Another big story in uh, 2022 was the rise of NVIDIA in HPC. If you want to make big bucks in the compute market in modern times, you have to have a solution for the customers that want the best massive scale performance. And HPC was all over the news all year long. And NVIDIA, as I said, claimed a lot of attention with a little product going by the name of Grace Hopper. So it all started back in March when Jensen Huang stood up at NVIDIA GTC to announce the Hopper GPU architecture. Now, of course, all of us who love computer history were really uh, excited about the name of this product. But even more important was the architecture, a truly disaggregated, distributed, scalable CPU plus GPU architecture uh, that, that we really saw emerge all throughout 2022. In June, uh, NVIDIA announced that they were going to be uh, powering a new supercomputer for Los Alamos. And uh, these, uh, this uh, supercomputer would use, in fact, Grace Hopper, uh, as well as uh, part of uh, NVIDIA's HGX platform. Um, now, Intel wasn't taking this lying down since uh, s this has been a, a traditionally strong market for them as well. And so they made some announcements as well at, uh, at that, same, uh, that same event uh, in June, uh, talking about how they were going to be using um, uh, Falcon Shores and Rialto Bridge. Uh, but un unfortunately for them, um, they later had to delay the launch of Sapphire Rapids to the point that in, uh, later in the year, in third and fourth quarter, uh, when a lot of these things were being announced as well at supercomputing, um, frankly, NVIDIA got a lot of the press and Intel didn't. But that being said, uh, it wasn't all about NVIDIA. Um, in fact, uh, Intel did get a little bit of notice for the fact that at supercomputing, a lot of people were uh, brazenly showing off Sapphire Rapids uh, HPC parts and talking about Sapphire Rapids, even though the product hasn't even been launched. In fact, it hasn't even been launched as of now. So that's kind of weird. But I, I have to say, NVIDIA really takes the HPC crown for 2022, and it's going to be really hard for any company, um, Intel, AMD, or some of these upstarts, to knock that off their heads in 2023. Well, Stephen, the future of computing is in the quantum realm.
but it doesn't mean the future is here yet. We did have a couple of quantum stories this year that I thought were kind of interesting. The first came back in May when the White House said that they needed to have quantum proof encryption. Uh, this was a story that I covered on Conversations back in 2021. We talked about the fact that a quantum computer, when it finally hits the right level, can absolutely invalidate all forms of RSA encryption. And it didn't take the U.S. government long to get there because by early July, we had uh, NIST approving some uh, candidates for quantum proof encryption. And they had a list of algorithms that they wanted people to start figuring out and uh, see if they were going to work or not. And boy, it didn't take long after a month. We already invalidated a couple of them for some quite honestly silly reasons, like things that should have been caught earlier in the process. But what I think is exciting about this story in this group of, of news is that it shows that we have finally hit a point where people understand the value, but also the challenges associated with quantum computing about how it needs to rethink our security model. And even a story we just covered a couple of weeks ago where Dell is trying to integrate quantum computing offerings into some of their cloud by creating this bridge between the two and offering it as a service. I think we're gonna see a lot more stories about quantum computing in 2023 as it becomes more mainstream for people that need that very specific type of processing power. Another technology that's going mainstream in uh, 2023 is CXL. So as you've heard, uh, we do a podcast here called Utilizing CXL, and we're going to be focusing on it throughout the year. But the reason for that is because there's been so many exciting announcements technology-wise. CXL is planning to change the way that computers look and act. And it's not a shift in consumption, but a fundamental change in the way that they're designed and constructed. From PCIe to UCIe to the next generation server platforms that we've discussed, CXL is emerging as the technology to watch in the enterprise data center. And all of that happened in 2022. So all of this sort of, uh, we, we started talking about CXL actually in uh, 2021, especially uh, with the news that uh, Gen Z and CXL were joining forces in November of that year. But things uh, really heated up this year. And, and in many ways, it wasn't directly CXL itself, because that was basically uh, kind of on the roadmap to come to market, but supporting technologies. So in the first half of the year, we heard a lot about other technologies that are involved with CXL. So for example, uh, we had the uh, PCI Special Interest Group announce uh, PCI Express 6.0, the final spec for PCIe 6 in January. And um, PCIe 6 is a fundamental technology to the next generation of uh, CXL devices that are going to be coming out, uh, sort of the next wave of CXL. We also heard about PCIe 7. Uh, this was another announcement that we got this year in, in, uh, in June, talking about increased bandwidth. And the insiders tell me that a lot of this work is really done as a way to support CXL in uh, future servers and to give additional capabilities to CXL. Now, there's a couple other things that are kind of going into this as well. There's another spec called UCIE that we talked about in March. And UCIE is really interesting because it's essentially a standard way to interconnect chiplets within a processor. So as you may know, most CPUs or processors these days are actually not a monolithic uh, wafer anymore. They're actually little things that are all kind of linked together. And those can be linked together in a few different ways. One way is something that we actually reported here as well uh, called just a bunch of wires. Uh, we talked about that, that in July, uh, which is something Open Compute Foundation was pitching. But another way is a technology called UCIE that was announced uh, back in uh, March. UCIE, think about it as sort of, um, it brings in uh, concepts and technologies from PCI Express, from uh, CXL, and uh, from all sorts of other areas of computing in, in, in a way to have you um, stitch together different little chiplets from maybe even different manufacturers, maybe man manufacturer on different process nodes, all on the same chip. But just like the PCIe announcement, all of this is related to CXL, and all of this is related to sort of changing the way computers will look in the future. And CXL continued to get a lot of uh, momentum. We saw this at the Flash Memory Summit in, in August as well, um, where uh, they announced that uh, OpenCAPI emerged with a CXL Forum, that was an, or CXL Consortium. That was another um, uh, competing, maybe, uh, pre-existing standard. Uh, so now the CXL uh, for Consortium includes basically all of OpenCAPI, uh, all of Gen Z, and a lot of that stuff is being brought into the spec. 
We also saw at the Flash Memory Summit a uh, CXL Forum Day that was repeated uh, with us uh, and our friends at Memverge in New York, and then again at Open Compute Summit, where we brought together the entire industry that's working on CXL devices. And boy, it was a lot. Um, for example, uh, Samsung uh, was first to market with a uh, CXL memory expansion card, and since then we heard about one from SK Hynix as well. Uh, we heard companies, uh, Estera Labs, uh, Intelliprop, Rambus, uh, working on uh, supporting chipsets as well. And as I said, the big news came uh, at uh, supercomputing when AMD released uh, Genoa, which includes uh, CXL support, uh, 1.1, as well as uh, more than that in uh, with PCIe 5. So basically, CXL is coming. CXL is here. And it was uh, a, a big news story for us in 2022. And it will be in 2023 as well. Well, there was another big news story that happened in 2022. And honestly, I thought VMware getting spun out of Dell was going to be one of the biggest stories involving D VMware for quite a while. Boy, was I wrong. Because uh, Broadcom and VMware managed to top that this year. We first heard about this happening back in late May. There was a discussion that Broadcom might be looking to pick up VMware. And a lot of people were wondering, well, what's going on here? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, which touched off a firestorm of discussion. We, we heard about how this was just another uh, notch in the, the post for VMware's uh, acquisition hoopla. Uh, think about all the number of times they've been bought. Honestly, it was another notch for Broadcom, who has uh, wanted to shift away from using chips as their primary source of revenue into more of a software focus to diversify income. And of course, as soon as the announcement happened, both the companies went into a quiet period where they couldn't really talk about it. And that quiet period extended across VM, oh, sorry, VMware Explore, which is the new VM world. And a lot of companies were there showcasing some of the things they were talking about, but there was a very big elephant in the show floor about what might happen in the future. Was VMware gonna suffer from R&D cuts? Was Broadcom going to raise prices to recoup the investment of $61 billion as the reported cost of this acquisition? Well, Hawk Tan ended up having to come out with a statement in December saying, no, we're not going to raise prices, which left a lot of people wondering, well, then how exactly are you going to make money off of this? And given the fact that we recently reported on the fact that some of VMware's employees are starting to depart for different opportunities, it does kind of make us everyone wonder what's going to happen in 2023. Will the deal go through as planned? Will there be something that gets in the way? Or quite honestly, will some other crazy random occurrence happen that will, um, you know, force the way that this acquisition happens through a completely different lens? There's no telling. With Pat Gelsinger firmly at the reins of Intel, there was a ton of news, both up and down from the chick making giant. The rundown was there for all of it, from the spin out of the SSD business with SK Hynix to Solidime, to the end of the Optane uh, business and the announcement of new fabs in Germany, advanced process nodes, and third party manufacturing. But unfortunately, the biggest news was negative, with the extended delay of Sapphire Rapids and other products, and news of cost cuts and job losses later in the year. Let's kind of look back at the year for Intel and the ups and the downs there. As I mentioned, uh, everything started off in January with the announcement that Intel was going to sell their SSD business, and that led to the creation of an entirely new company called Solidime, which brought in the assets of Intel's SSDs and flash memory, as well as uh, SK Hynix. Uh, since then, Solidime has really ramped up and done quite well with themselves. But of course, the news about the flash memory side of things led to some questions about what Intel was going to do with their other memory slash storage product, Optane. And uh, news wasn't always good. Uh, back in March, we got a uh, lot of rumors that Intel was going to be canceling Optane. And um, this was uh, continued, there was a continual talk about this until uh, something really big happened in August. And that is that Intel announced as a, kind of a footnote in a financial filing that they're gonna be closing the entire Optane business unit and uh, taking a impairment against the, the, that. Uh, of course, everybody immediately freaked out because Optane was a major differentiator for Intel's third generation Xeon platform. And people were looking for it as a big differentiator for Sapphire Rapids as well, which was expected to be announced pretty soon. Now, uh, the cancellation of the Optane uh, group, the Optane development, didn't mean the end of the Optane products, though. And in fact, 
um, we are hearing that uh, Intel is continuing to release um, planned Optane products. In fact, they might have just released an, an Optane SSD uh, as you hear this. And I think that we're going to see a next generation Optane persistent memory launch with Sapphire Rapids as well. But I think the writing's pretty well on the wall that Optane's not going any further than this. This all leads to a lot of questions about Intel. And frankly, uh, the, the questions were not alleviated when it was revealed that the Sapphire Rapids would be delayed even further. Um, Intel was supposed to be first to market for the fourth generation server platforms with Sapphire Rapids. Uh, they were going to have HPC products as well uh, for supercomputing. And those products did show up at supercomputing, but Sapphire Rapids is still not announced as of press time. And AMD managed to launch their fourth generation platform ahead of Intel. What this means is that AMD supports CXL and Intel doesn't yet. A uh, lot of negative news coming out as well about job cuts and cost cuts and uh, negatives from uh, the financial space. Overall, what I would say is uh, this is a, a big year of retrenchment. Uh, Pat Gelsinger is clearly taking firm control of the company. Uh, they're shaking things up. They're cutting products that they don't want to be invested in. Uh, they're doing an IPO for Mobileye, for example. All of these things are basically on the table. And although it doesn't look good in 2022 for Intel, I think that all of these moves are actually going to lead to a healthier company going forward. So I'm going to go on record here and say that uh, 2023 is going to look a little bit rocky for Intel, but I bet we're going to have some better news from the company uh, later in 2023 and into 2024 when all of these changes that Pat Gelsinger has made, including the construction of new fabs and the development of new process nodes and the third party fab business, when all of those things start uh, really kicking in. I think Intel's maybe kind of at the bottom here. Well, Stephen, uh, we always do a closer look here on the rundown. And of course, the closest look that we really needed to take uh, overall this year was kind of the economy, if you want to take that as a big picture story, because the greater economy globally was driven by some big geopolitical news, but some smaller shifts in the tech industry that I think kind of line up with some of those bigger geopolitical uh, concerns. So what, what was the biggest thing you think that happened in 2022 that drove a lot of this? Well, I have to say, Tom, the biggest thing globally that happened in 2022 was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And of course, uh, this is a serious news story in many, many different ways, both politically in terms of humanitarian uh, challenges for the people there, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, Western support for, for the Ukrainian army, um, all the things that have happened. But of course, there's a really big tech angle here as well. Uh, Russia has long been involved in the global tech economy, as has Ukraine. And yet, all of these activities have been dramatically impacted by the, by the Russian invasion, to the point that ever since March, uh, we've been seeing uh, Russia really ostracized in a way that almost no other country has. As I talked about before, the U.S. is really aggressively moving against China and trying to restrict access to China. But of course, uh, that's nothing like what they're doing uh, to Russia. And uh, this is causing all sorts of trouble for, for, for many, many tech companies. But of course, it's also impacting Ukrainian tech companies. And it's important to recognize that there are a lot, there's a lot of tech in Ukraine. A lot of that has had to move out because of the war. A lot of the people are uh, refugees in other countries now. But it's uh, actually kind of heartening to see that a lot of the Ukrainian companies are still actually doing OK, even though maybe they're not even in, the, in Ukraine anymore um, where they're working. But we did talk as well about the impact on China and the concerns that China would be supporting Russia, uh, the impact on India, which is another country that has historically had strong ties with Russia. And, and this, this story is completely unresolved at this point. But it's safe to say that the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not limited to humanitarian and political issues, and it certainly impacts the tech industry. Another um, real economic uh, headwind that we're seeing in the tech industry is a slowdown in venture capital spending. So we've uh, long been watching venture capital uh, spending as a way to sort of see what's next, uh, what's coming to enterprise tech, uh, and, and it comes in waves. I mean, we've lived here in Tech Field Day and Gestalt IT through many, many different technology waves, and you see new companies funded, and they come out with new products, but that's not really happening as much right now. And in fact, uh, back in June, we saw a uh, announcement that uh, from Sequoia, a large venture capital firm that said, look, 
we're not going to be investing quite so much. And this is what we've seen actually all throughout the second half of the year, a slowdown in investments, a retrenchment, companies looking to kind of shore up their finances. We saw sort of a last wave of uh, venture capital funding rounds going into some companies. uh, and, And that's great news for those companies, but also a pullback in venture capital and a real concern about spending, about the economy. I think COVID, I think China, I think Russia, all of these things are impacting this overall trend. But I think also there's just a desire to see sort of where does this tech wave end? Where does it go? And when does the profit come? Now, Tom, we've seen some of the profit, right, from some of the corporate acquisitions this year. Yeah, it seemed like there were a ton of acquisitions, but there were a couple that I thought were were especially interesting. Uh, one of them happened back in June when Oracle bought Cerner for like $28 billion. You may think to yourself, well, why did Oracle want to buy a medical records company? Well, there's two reasons. One, they wanted to diversify their revenue stream because I believe Cerner was one of the largest customers of Oracle Cloud. So that allowed them to kind of have a different area to do things. But also... When you look at the greater shifts in the way that funding is happening and the fact that tech stocks took an absolute pounding on the stock market, a lot of these acquisitions, at least last year, were being driven by these high stock prices. So I think Oracle was trying to get in on that last wave of, hey, let's trade some goodwill and a few shares to pick up a big acquisition because things are going to get a little leaner pretty soon and we need to be able to have different ideas around what we're trying to do. And that was one of the big stories about, you know, that kind of tech acquisition craze. The other one kind of speaks to the fact that a lot of venture capitalists are saying, listen, we're not going to give you any more funding until you can prove that you're profitable. And that was driven to make other smaller companies maybe rethink their exit strategy. I think one of the ones that kind of illustrates this perfectly to me is a company like Pluribus Networks. I've talked to Pluribus Networks a number of times. They're a company that's pivoted a couple of times in their, you know, long life. And eventually it came time to ask the really hard questions. Is it time for us to pivot once again, or should we look for somebody else who can kind of help us operationalize and make money off this technology? And in the case of Pluribus, it was the latter. They were picked up by Arista back in August, but they're not the only company that's made that decision. Some of them have gone from public to private to be, um, you know, divided up and and sent out in other places. Some of them are also looking at more of these key strategic partnerships that eventually become acquisition. And at the end of the year, we're starting to see, you hear lots of rumors about other crazy things that could persist into 2023. But I think another key indicator of what's happening is the fact that a lot of companies are seeing key executives depart for other jobs. We briefly mentioned some of the VMware executives departing out as in the middle of this Broadcom acquisition, but one that really got me was when Todd Nightingale left Cisco back in August. Now, you may not know the name Todd Nightingale, but you definitely know the the business unit that he ran, Meraki. And after the end of Cisco's fiscal year, when uh, things were looking really bright for Meraki and Cisco in general, Todd said, you know what, maybe it's time for me to go do something else. And he actually departed for Fastly. But this is something that we see in those times when there's a little bit of technical strife is that the executives and the the brain trust in certain companies say, you know, maybe it's time for me to strike while the iron's hot, uh, take advantage of some cheaper capital and maybe go out and build something big. We saw it back in 08, 09 and 2010 uh, when the Great Recession happened. I think we're going to see that going forward. Not ready to say that there is a recession, but I'm ready to say that with all of these factors that are going on, it's causing a lot of folks to question where they're at question where they're going and make some harder decisions than they might have otherwise been willing to make. And I think that that's going to change the way that tech looks as we go forward with more rundown stories. Yep, absolutely. And I'm going to be looking at, uh, I think we're going to be talking about a lot of acquisitions in 2023. Uh, We've already uh, seen a rumor of uh, Nutanix getting acquired. Uh, We'll see where that goes. But I think that there will be more and more acquisitions and hopefully more of these uh, founders uh, going out and starting a new company because uh, that's that's the exciting thing. Uh, We love to see new technology and new companies form. So I guess we'll see what uh, 2023 brings. Exactly. And if you want to tune in for some of the good stuff that we have coming in 2023, absolutely the rundown is the best place to do that. But there's even more because in addition to the rundown, if you want to get the hottest, latest technology discussions, the best place to do that is over at Tech Field Day. Stephen, what have we got coming up at Tech Field Day that people should definitely keep an eye on? 
Well, we've got a bunch of different uh, Tech Field Day events coming up this year. Uh, we've announced a lot of them through the first half of the year, including uh, Networking Field Day, Security Field Day, uh, Cloud Field Day, Storage Field Day, you know, the ones that, uh, that you've heard of, as well as a Tech Field Day uh, event focused on CXL technology, which is something that, of course, has come up in the news quite a lot. Another big announcement that we're making is the first Edge Field Day. So that's happening in uh, February. And we're very excited to see uh, what happens with the world of edge computing. Of course, uh, we've got some podcasts uh, as well. Tom, you want to tell us about those? Well, Stephen, we have a lot of great podcasts here at Gestalt IT for those of you who like to consume your news and your discussion in that format. The first is the on-premise IT podcast, which we've been doing for a number of years. Uh, we release it weekly. We come up with a premise, a topic, if you will, to discuss with a group of uh, smart folks from the enterprise IT space. Sometimes the, uh, the topic is something that's going to make you a little angry, but that's the idea is we want you to understand where people are coming from and the perspectives that are important as we discuss what's going on. The other thing, which is a little bit calmer and a little more exciting, of course, is utilizing CXL, which is something that Stephen Foskett and a group of great folks in the industry are discussing. We talked a little bit about CXL and, and how, what a big year it was in 2022. But if you want to see where this technology is headed and how it's going to revolutionize what we see in the data center in 2023 and beyond, you're definitely going to want to tune in. There's more information about that. We'll include it in the show notes, both for the on-premise IT podcast and utilizing CXL. So make sure you subscribe and listen. You can find the uh, on-premise IT podcast, uh, utilizing tech slash utilizing CXL, and of course, the rundown in your favorite podcast application and on YouTube. Before we go, though, I do want to give a special thank you to the co-hosts, the staff, and everyone else who supported uh, this, this year's rundown. So first off, let me give a shout out to Chris Grundeman, uh, Calvin Hendricks-Parker, uh, Max Mortolaro, Gerard Cavallinas, Steve Faluca, Nathaniel Bennett, and of course, Chris Reed, who all joined us this year as hosts, uh, co-hosts, fill-in hosts for uh, the Gestalt IT Rundown. We love you guys. Thank you so much for jumping in and being part of this. Also, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to the man behind the curtain, uh, Mr. Corey Derrick, who produces all of these episodes, does all of our video editing, does all of the putting up with all the crazy stuff from me and Tom. Corey, uh, we really appreciate having you, and we're really glad to have you involved, not just on the rundown, but of course, on all of the Gestalt IT products. So Corey, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to working with you again in uh, 2023. Also, one more uh, thank you to all of those who have listened who have commented, who have sent us emails or contacted us on social media and said that you enjoy what we're doing here with The Rundown. We really sincerely appreciate your support. Uh, that's why we do it. We're not doing this for the numbers. We don't have ads. We're doing this for you. We're doing this because it's a great way for us to connect with you. And we really love to hear from you. So if you're listening, uh, throw us a line, You know, send us a message. Maybe send one to Corey too, uh, just to know that, we, that you appreciate it, that you're listening. Um, we, we sincerely appreciate your, uh, your time every single week. All right. Well, that'll just about do it for this episode of The Rundown. And honestly, for 2022, we're uh, going to be taking the next week off because, uh, well, you know, it's that quiet period of the year and there's nothing exciting that ever happens, right? Well, even if it does, we'll be back with another great episode of The Rundown in January. So if you have any stories, please make sure you tweet them at Gestalt IT. Use the hashtag Rundown. We'll be keeping an eye out for them as well. And we will be back uh, on the first Wednesday of 2023 with more great content. So set your watch, 1230 Eastern Time, for The Rundown. Until then, from Tom Hollingsworth, Stephen Foskett, the amazing staff here at Gestalt IT, all of our wonderful co-hosts, and you, your amazing community that keeps this going. Sincerely, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for a great year. We'll be back in 2023. Take care.